NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. You know, my job mostly entails working with Congress and at the federal level. So this is actually a really exciting conversation for me because I get to see what's going on in the states. Um, so as Monica said, the Drug Policy Alliance is an organization that works to end the war on drugs. We work on marijuana in addition to uh, a number of other drug policy issues. Um, additionally, we also really invest in criminal justice reform. So again, good to be here. And I'm going to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. If you could share your name. Um, your, and just tell us about your position and what your organization does and where you're based. And I'll go ahead and start um, left to right, how I see folks on my screen, starting with Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hello, my name is Ian Sieb. I am Governor Jared Polis, Special Policy Advisor on Cannabis here in Colorado. Prior to my work here, I was uh, fortunate enough to have established one of the first legal, medical, and recreational dispensaries in Colorado, Denver Relief, uh, Denver Relief Consulting, a consulting company. And I'm the former two-time chairman of the board of the National Cannabis Industry Association. Finally, I am a 10-year uh, long board member of the Anti-Defamation League's Regional Board here in Denver, Colorado. Thank you. Thanks. Chelsea? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chelsea Higgs Wise. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am based in Richmond, Virginia, and as the executive director of Marijuana Justice. Uh, we work in tandem with a Legalize It Right coalition right here uh, to work for an equitable legalization for the Commonwealth in Virginia. We've been working for about two years specifically. And um, as we'll talk about, uh, we've had some. You, great changes in the last couple of years, but our main focus is on an equitable legalization process here in the Commonwealth. Thank you, Sarah. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah. My pronouns are she, her. I am the executive director for The Last Prisoner Project. We are a national organization at the intersection of criminal justice reform and cannabis policy. Um, in my role, I oversee everything at the organization, but I also, I also lead our direct service programs on the legal side. Um, we also have policy and reentry arms, but on our legal side, we actually work in partnership with NACDL um, on a federal and state clemency project. Thanks for that. So for this first question, I just wanna hear what's going on in people's states. So if you guys wanna give a quick update on the status of marijuana policy in your states, and Sarah, if, if you just wanna share anything um, related to anything exciting that your organization might be working on if you don't have a state update. So why don't we um, start in the same direction that we were just going in? So Ian, starting with you. Sure, thank you. Um, so the status of what's going on in Colorado is we are, we are, uh, have been for the past uh, for the past decade heavily involved in both uh, medical and retail legislation as well as hemp related legislation. It's been 11 years since we first regulated medical marijuana and going on seven and a half years for uh, adult use marijuana in Colorado. Uh, the past year uh, in particular has taken uh, a shifting of priorities. We focused heavily on social equity. That was something, uh, we'll get into it later on in the panel, but something that we didn't do in Colorado. So we've had a, a big shift in working in social equity. We, uh, we defined what social equity applicants are. We were able to secure funding uh, to stand up uh, an office to the tune of $4 million. And just uh, less than a month ago, we announced the creation of the Cannabis Business Office, which is an extension of the Office of Economic Development and International Trade uh, whose mission is going to be supporting our social equity applicants in Colorado with technical assistance, grants, and loans, not dissimilar from what SBA currently does. Along with uh, the creation of that office uh, was an expungement or pardon component of, of social equity as well. And uh, under the powers afforded to him last year, the governor pardoned 2,732 previous marijuana convictions for possession of up to an ounce. 
This past year, we were able to raise the possession limit through the Colorado legislature for adults over the age of 21 from one ounce to two ounces. And as a result, under those previous pardon provisions from the previous year, the governor has been given the authority to pardon people uh, who have previous uh, possession convictions for up to two ounces. So we're currently working on that. I expect that that will be coming forth uh, fairly shortly. In addition, we've engaged heavily in working with our local jurisdictions to work around delivery and hospitality. Many of them have chosen to set aside uh, licenses. We work in a, a dual licensing state, meaning that both the state and local jurisdictions need to uh, allow licensure and uh, you need to have acceptance from both dual, uh, both state and local. So as a result, some, some local jurisdictions have started to permit both hospitality and delivery and going a step further, many of them have set aside those licenses and or any licenses specifically and exclusively for social equity applicants. Denver, for example, has said that uh, for the next seven years, only social equity applicants will be permitted to, uh, to enter into, into new licenses. And I'm pleased to announce that just yesterday in Denver, Colorado, um, Duba uh, is the name of the company, uh, created or had their first uh, legal adult use marijuana delivery in, in Denver, Colorado, and it was from a social equity applicant. So lots going on. Um, this next year, I expect even more to happen. Uh, we, we continue to focus on social equity. We'll, we'll be excited to see um, those who our marijuana enforcement division applicants apply into this program as we start to uh, to move it forward. Yeah, definitely, definitely a lot going on there. Yeah, um, yeah. Kelsey, yeah that's just a little bit of it. <laughs> right, yeah, that was a little unexpected, I gotta say, but I guess it kind of goes to show that, you know, legalization is just the beginning and there's a lot to figure out after that, <laughs> which, we'll, which we're all kind of learning, I think. Um, but Chelsea, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so Virginia has also had a busy last couple of months and years. So right here in Virginia, um, we're really excited to say that we're the first state in the South that has repealed the uh, prohibition of simple possession. So July 1, right here this year for the first time in Virginia, uh, we are able to possess up to one ounce without any type of penalty. Um, of course, there are some stars and disclaimers with that, uh, depending on all sorts of um, documentation status and where you live. And, and that also means of where you're able to consume in your private home. Um, and we're also able to have four plants per household. So a home cultivation, which also creates that access. Um, Virginia was also able to pass um, creating a Virginia Cannabis Control Authority that will oversee the regulatory model for commercial sales that will start in 2024. So we're really um, also excited that we saw some expungement or what we call sealing of records um, measures that were taking place with this legalization. There was more to come here in Virginia as there was also a, a historic expungement bill that was passed this year that will also encompass marijuana more in 2025. Um, another big part that we were excited about with this bill um, that's included, but I really want to mention to folks that much of our bill is going to be reenacted and we're going to come back actually in 2022 to do most of it all over again, um, particularly about the regulations, the commercial industry, uh, the social equity, but also just ensuring, just like Ian was saying, some big news that just came out of Colorado, um, just recently this week in Virginia, um, our watchdog agency that does a lot of our research is now suggesting to the General Assembly to actually um, increase a penalty that we have right now for possession as a civil penalty to a misdemeanor. So this was presented this week to our Joint Commission um, of Oversight of Cannabis. So um, just as we thought we were really moving forward with less, uh, we got to keep that fight going. But um, that's where we are right now in Virginia. Thanks. And Sarah? So I'm actually based in Connecticut, where we did just recently uh, fully legalize for adult use. But I think I'll talk about the work that we are doing in California, since there's a little bit more going on on the criminal justice side in that state. Um, so if you're not familiar, California legalized for adult use in 2016. Part of that legislation um, included resentencing provisions um, and then a follow-up piece of legislation, um, AB 1793, was a bill to automatically expunge cannabis records. And I think 
people in um, the criminal justice space and the cannabis advocacy space often look to California as a model um, for the types of retroactive relief provisions that we really want to see happen in tandem with any kind of comprehensive legislation for legalization. Unfortunately, what we have found in California um, is that those pieces of legislation are not being effectuated like we would hope. Um, so on the resentencing side, unfortunately, this will come, I'm sure, as no shock to the criminal justice advocates. We have no kind of clear accounting or data on who has actually received any kind of resentencing under Prop 64. Um, and we've sort of heard anecdotally from progressive prosecutors that this is not really happening on any kind of widespread scale. Um, so part of what we're doing in California is working with those progressive prosecutors um, to try to effectuate more resentencing and identify individuals who might be eligible whether they are currently incarcerated or if someone is still serving out a sentence of supervised release, they might be eligible for that resentencing as well. Um, so that's one piece that we're trying to effectuate in California. On the automatic expungement side, um, again, I think this is the part people really look to California and you know, you see in headlines, you know, oh, tens of thousands of people automatically had their records cleared. That's really not happening, or again, we don't actually have any kind of accounting of whether or not that's happening. We have identified, you know, numbers of individuals who might be eligible, but there are a lot of barriers to counties actually effectuating this record clearance. Um, and a lot of counties too have passed the deadline that they had to actually proactively expunge these records. And so the co-sponsor of that bill, or actually the sponsor um, was Rob, Rob Bonta, who recently became attorney general in California. Um, and so we're working with that office to hopefully effectuate the spirit of that bill, understand first, you know, at the county level, what are the barriers? Um, can we identify, you know, who has actually received this relief um, versus who is eligible for the relief? And how can we incentivize these counties or give them the resources and the tools that they need to effectuate this? And what can the attorney general do for his position to effectuate, again, this bill that he was sponsor on? Um, so a lot of work to be done, but I think, again, it goes to, you know, Maritza, what you were saying and what we've seen in Colorado, not only is legalization the start, and there's a lot of follow-up work we have to do both around equity and criminal justice to ensure that we're fully repairing the harms of prohibition when we legalize, but even when a state has the best of intentions and thinks more thoroughly about including those kinds of retroactive relief provisions around resentencing or record clearance, um, there's still a lot of lessons to be learned about how to do that systemically and equitably. So that's the piece that we're working on in California and across the board in states that have legalized. So these next questions I'm gonna kind of combine because they're related. And I think we've already kind of started to dig into them a little bit, um, but I'm wondering in your view, what do you all think must be a component of any state or even federal marijuana policy that moves forward? And maybe this is tied to what inequities you all are seeing um, because you know I think as we are learning lessons, um, at least in my experience, I have seen things that, you know, that could be improved upon. And I'm sure you have had, you all have seen the same things. Um, so I guess like, what do you think is critical to any legislation? What gaps or inequities do you think are still very much present in, in marijuana policy? And whoever wants to answer this, we can, um, whoever wants to volunteer to go first can go at it. Well, I can start since I, I was just sort of speaking a bit on this. Um, so I think, again, legalization is just the start. Um, and in many states, especially the earlier states, we were very forward looking in even trying to have equity provisions or justice provisions. You know, moving forward, we're no longer going to criminalize uh, cannabis use or sale of cannabis. Um, moving forward, we're going to create this equitable industry. But what has been really lacking across the board is that backwards looking relief for those who have previously been harmed by, pro by prohibition and the criminalization of cannabis. And so again, we have not really seen 
any state, I think, get it exactly right and trying to effectuate that relief, either for those who have a cannabis offense on their record or those who are still incarcerated and um, require some kind of resentencing relief for a cannabis offense. Um, the other piece of it beyond those retroactive relief measures is something that we also aren't seeing a lot in a lot of states is on the reentry side for individuals who are coming home and might want to participate in the now regulated industry. There's often barriers, you know, like in many others and just other industries put up for those individuals who want to participate. So oftentimes, if you have a felony offense on your record, you can't actually be an operator in the legal industry or even be employed in the legal industry. Um, and so I think there's both on the equity side, room to create space for those who have been most impacted by the criminalization of cannabis as owners, but even just in terms of workforce development, we need to be doing a much better job of incentivizing companies to hire um, individuals that are coming home, especially those that are coming home for cannabis offenses, um, because they often would be incredible employees in this industry, in an industry that at a time when many industries are losing jobs, um, are suffering during a global pandemic, the cannabis industry is still booming, was often in almost every state declared essential during the pandemic. And so there's a lot of employment opportunities for returning citizens. Um, so we really need to ensure that that is also a piece of comprehensive legalization. I think that that's, I think that that's a really good point, Sarah. I, there, there's a, a critical piece of something that happened a couple years ago in Colorado that I failed to mention that I think uh, could, could serve as some type of model. And that is that we created uh, an accelerator program. It was a predecessor to the social equity pro program actually providing funding, but it's an opportunity to provide uh, incubating, uh, incubating people and businesses so that they have an opportunity to learn from people who have actually been in business um, in, at least in the regulated industries. So I'd encourage those who are interested um, in, in, in possibly implementing legislation to look at the accelerator program. There's a lot of challenges with it. It did not come with funding grants. It, it's simply the ability to work and, and um, increase that workforce development. Some of the other pieces that I think that are important is, um, is looking at regulations. And as you create regulations, um, Colorado effectively looked at those who were looking to get into the industry a decade ago as criminals, and it was uh, it was really up to the applicant to prove that they weren't a criminal instead of looking at it uh, the other way around, which is people looking to get in business and creating opportunities to allow those past disenfranchisements or those past convictions um, or things that have happened to people to not be a disqualifier. And so as we get into looking at creating creating those regulations, not having uh, not having disqualifications for previous related convictions is is essential um, to to moving forward with, with legislation. As Sarah was suggesting, some of the most talented people are those who got caught up in the legal system and ended up becoming incarcerated individuals and are quite possibly the best qualified to to get involved. And so, by not automatically handicapping them out of the gate and not discriminating against them and preventing them from being a part of the legislation on day one, it's it's one of the things that's really important as any state and certainly as we move forward with potential uh, federal regulations, that, that it's something that we consider. And I'll look specifically to what's going on with hemp and one of the challenges associated with hemp is that even today with these new federal regulations, there is a timeout. If you have a felony you can't participate for 10 years today for hemp, for something that doesn't even have uh, intoxicating elements to it, um, generally speaking. So it, it, it's really like, we, this is going on today for something with that, that's not intoxicating. So as we move forward, it's gonna be really important to see that at the federal level. Uh, thank you uh, for that. And I, um, 
have a, a list of things that we need to put in there. Most of it has been touched on already. I, before I uh, gather a little bit of what Virginia has done, I also want to offer a little bit of more thought and consideration, even around the incubator program that was mentioned. That is something that was brought up here in Virginia as well. And a lot of folks, including myself, are asking the questions about what type of even conflict of interest that may be. This is a private industry that is then supposed to be incubating someone that is then going to be their competition. And, and what type of responsibility the Commonwealth and the state really has in ensuring that their social equity applicants um, have training from someone that doesn't have that per perhaps skewed bias. Uh, so just something else to continue to think about as we are continuing to really uh, build programs for our social equity folks that was, again, just discussed this past week as the, the conversations are starting to evolve. Also some things of um, what needs to be included or maybe not included. Uh, we actually put more money to law enforcement and uh, doing drugged driving and recognizing legal is, and recognizing weed within the car. Um, we see this as a, a continuation and repetition of what we're really trying to stop. So looking at um, around vehicles, and we understand this particularly with the federal um, law right now, that's really difficult. Um, also, we had no resentencing in Virginia as well. Just wanted to lift that. That was a problem here. Um, our expungement is very limited to misdemeanor, sealed. Our felony threshold is still on petition basis and not even coming for 2025. Um, we also have absolutely felony um, folks with felonies are not able to participate. They're not able to apply. Um, so again, the, those same barriers that are coming up, uh, something that we're seeing across the nation, uh, public housing, federally so subsidized housing folks are not able to consume safely. And those folks right now in the pandemic are being con uh, evicted as well as over-policed. Um, and then, you know, we talked a lot about the, the folks that uh, have been hurt in the past. What I'd really like to continue to see, and I'm asking even our legislators here, is being able to do studies on the actual uh, cost of prohibition on someone's lives, and not just at, a, at the misdemeanor level like we saw here in Virginia, on all convictions, on the incarceration, as well as on the family level. That's something here in Virginia we're pushing is to talk about the child welfare, child separations due to cannabis as well. So. Um, I could continue to go down the list. And as I mentioned before, even um, adding new crimes like this misdemeanor for possession when we just repealed it. Um, so there, there are many things to, to look at, but particularly just um, making sure that we're repealing every part that we have somehow um, legalized to enforce around cannabis. Yeah, that's actually a perfect segue into the next question around resentencing. Um, and Sarah, this one is specifically for you. But since we know that resentencing legislation is still pretty uncommon, even in states that have legalized, what alternative solutions are there to release people who are incarcerated from marijuana? So again, we have seen resentencing built into legislation in a couple states, most recently New York and New Jersey. But like expungement in many states, it's very limited. Um, it's often only for low level offenses and overwhelmingly those that are incarcerated on lengthy sentences or would still be incarcerated at the time of legalization are not serving you know, for a solely possession offense. Um, by and large, you know, as we know in the criminal justice system, when someone gets a distribution or a manufacturing offense, even if it's for a smaller amount, um, they'll also get stacked charges of money laundering, a state racketeering charge, um, all a whole host of other ancillary charges that could get tacked on. So these pieces of legislation are not really being built to effectuate the kind of systemic relief for people who really are incarcerated just for selling cannabis um, at the state level or with the reforms that we've seen floated at the federal level. Um, so something that we're doing at LPP in conjunction with NACDL is as part of our cannabis justice initiative, 
pushing clemency programs at the state and federal level. Um, this is something Ian touched on, you know, in Colorado, Governor Polis effectuated thousands of pardons. Um, we've seen that also in Illinois. So that has been an effective tool more on the record clearance side. Um, we haven't really seen any kind of categorical clemency in terms of commutations and actually releasing those still incarcerated for cannabis. Um, but that's absolutely what we're pushing for is to have states and the federal government um, enact some kind of categorical clemency so that we could proactively identify and release those that are serving cannabis offenses. Um, and this is something we've seen historical precedent for on the federal level, um, most notably with Vietnam draft dodgers. So it's something that has been done. It's been used as an effective tool to make the clemency process a little more um, systematic, a little more widespread than what we've seen uh, under recent administrations. Um, so that is one tool. And I'll add something to something that Chelsea said um, as one of the hooks we use to get either legislatures or executive offices sort of bought into this idea. Um, we often use exactly that data point of what is the cost just of incarceration? So that's not even touching on the sort of societal or community cost of incarceration, um, but just what is the cost that we've spent incarcerating one person compared to what was the cost of the harm of the crime that they committed? And in the case of, you know, selling <laughs> cannabis or manufacturing cannabis, when you compare those costs, that really sells um, even someone who might be on the fence might be more conservative on the case of legalization, that it is absolutely nonsensical for states to be incarcerating people for years, sometimes for decades for cannabis offenses. Thanks. And now turning back to Colorado. So Ian, what lessons do you think other states and maybe even local, um, local jurisdictions can take away from the challenges Colorado has faced from being the first to regulate recreational cannabis? Sure. Um, well, I think that one of the things that I touched on earlier is, is not, having, uh, not having automatic disqualifiers put in place uh, at either the state level or the local level. Second, I think that it's really important. One of the things that Colorado frankly uh, missed in the beginning was being conscious of the conversation around social equity and acknowledging the fact that there are people that were disenfranchised by the war on drugs and that there should be an opportunity for, for those individuals to, uh, to perhaps have less of a pathway of resistance uh, Less, less of a pathway of resistance to, to getting into the industry. And so by setting aside uh, licenses, licenses for social equity applicants, by creating opportunities to provide technical assistance and grants and loans, it can cost anywhere from a few hundred thousand dollars to several million dollars to getting started. So it's unreasonable to think that a state is going to be able to fully fund the creation of, of, of a business. But to allow to to uh, to have technical assistance to create uh, create opportunities whereby uh, whereby businesses have the opportunity to work with people that are looking to get into business and finding people that want to support as well as people that want to take advantage or, or benefit from offices that are created. I think that that's that that's really critical. Um, additionally, I think that it's important to consider um, to consider things like setbacks, zoning requirements where people, uh, where licenses can take place. One of the challenges that we found here in Denver is there happens to be a heavy concentration of businesses in low socioeconomic areas. And why is that? Well, very obviously the NIMBY syndrome and people saying, you, you, we, we can have it, but not here. We're gonna move it a few miles down the road. And as a result, there was a big challenge associated with Denver with, with uh, heavy concentrations of cannabis. And what does that mean? How does it affect youth? How does it, what, what does, uh, what does it mean for the environment and what does it mean for an entire community? So being conscious and having, having conversations um, with, with local jurisdictions and with stakeholders and with the people who live in those communities is really um, essential <clears throat> that states and local municipalities really need to look to as they, as they create regulations. Finally, I think it's incumbent as, as we've moved on and as we've progressed here in Colorado, 
one of the things that uh, we're starting to see local municipalities and some states uh, set aside is uh, corporate social responsibility and good neighbor, uh, good neighbor agreements and how somebody is going to be, uh, you know, recognizing cannabis is still somewhat controversial and the, the wide differing views on, on uh, regulation versus prohibition, um, the opportunity to be good stewards and to be good members of the community and, and to suggest that you're going to be a contributing member is something that some states and local municipalities may wish to encourage for, for any types of businesses really, but specifically cannabis businesses given, uh, given the uh, unique subject and given the unique commodity and, and the rich historical context that it has in any community. So we've heard a lot about what's happening in each of the states. I did just want to give a brief um, federal overview for um, our audience and then, you know, turn it back to the panelists to, to comment on what's happening at the federal level. Um, so last year in December of 2020, um, the House made history when it passed the first bill that would actually legalize marijuana at the federal level, deschedule marijuana, completely removing it from the list of controlled substances. And that bill was the MORE Act, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. And we really did, and I say we, the Drug Policy Alliance led the coalition, the Marijuana Justice Coalition that really pushed for this bill and put the bill together. And we, again, built a diverse coalition to make sure that we were taking lessons as we, you know, as we were seeing states legalized across the country. So we wanted to create a bill that really centered people most impacted by marijuana prohibition and had really strong social justice components. And luckily, we were able to keep the bill pretty much intact as it went to the floor. Nonetheless, as always happens, there were some things that were, were put in there at last minute that we weren't too happy about that we're definitely going to be working to remove in this next iteration. Um, so the status of that bill is that it has been reintroduced, um, I believe, end of May. Um, so the goal for this year is to once again move it through the House. And again, learning lessons that, you know, we, we had to swallow last year. We hope to um, have a improved version of that bill pass the House. And the idea is that it's really supposed to build momentum for what's happening in the Senate. And let me just backtrack here and say that in addition to descheduling marijuana, the bill would use marijuana tax revenue to fund social justice programs like a community reinvestment program that would fund services um, in communities most impacted by drug prohibition, including legal services like expungement services. It would also invest money into the Small Business Administration to make sure that we are able to diversify the marijuana industry, again, centering people um, with records and people from communities who have been most impacted. In addition, we make it so that people can't lose federal benefits for any past marijuana activity and that non-citizens are also protected. Um, you know, a huge impact on non-citizens is the fact that marijuana remains a Schedule One drug, because if you're a non-citizen, you still may be in total compliance with your state and local laws, but because it became, remains a federally prohibited drug, you're still slammed with immigration consequences. So we really did try to build, up, build out a comprehensive bill, and the Senate took the MORE Act and used it as the framework for the public draft that they recently introduced, and that bill is the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. Um, what the Senate released, I think a couple months ago at this point, maybe last month, was just a public draft of what soon will be a bill. And it starts off, you know, the base is the MORE Act. In addition to that, uh, regulations are added. And as we started to talk about earlier, regulations are really important when we're, when we're thinking about equity in the industry um, and equitable policy generally. And the Senate has opened up public comments. So if that's something that you, you know, if you're interested in commenting on that legislation, it is an open process where different stakeholders can give advice on how to improve the bill before it's officially introduced, which I think will probably be later this year, but most likely next year, just because of how big it is. And I'm sure they're getting a ton of stakeholder feedback. So from you all, what I'm really interested in hearing is what do you all think has to be included in any federal marijuana legalization bill? In other words, what must the federal government do or not do to support some of the great work that you guys are doing? And I'm really interested in, in, in this part too, but I guess, how do we ensure that, you know, existing equity programs have the support they need to continue um, serving different constituencies or specific constituencies, or how do we strengthen equity programs, I guess, across the country? So I know that's like a lot, but I guess like the general question is, what do you all think absolutely must be included in any federal marijuana bill that moves forward? And whoever wants to answer this can go first.
I'll go ahead and jump in. And this is some things that we've mentioned before, but absolutely the expungements and the participation of those that have been previously incarcerated and impacted, number one. Um, also, um, just wanted to, to talk about a little bit of how to do this, because there's so many things that we could talk about. But I think the biggest thing that I'm having a conversation and watching the federal government, and as we're trying to build these social equity programs that haven't even started in Virginia, I just really hope that the federal government is going to take the time to do this slowly and give it time. Um, that's really where we are. And in order to try and do this right is to, is to give it the time that it needs, and particularly give that time to also social equity applicants that we need are going to have to have a, a bit of a head start for this particular industry. Um, and also looking at what this interstate commerce can, can do um, and will do to our, our homegrown equity uh, programs there. So I think that's just gonna take time to really look at and, and hear from different voices. But um, as far as what's included in the bill, definitely the expungements and the participations um, and, and allowing folks to consume within their own housings and things. And I will add, I think I forgot to mention that, but the bill does include um, resentencing and expungement provisions, which is great. Nonetheless, I think um, we should, you know, I think even go beyond that when we're thinking about people who have been impacted, right? Um, did anybody else want to jump in? I'll jump in on that point. Um, so, you know, I think it is, of course, symbolically really important that the first comprehensive piece of legalization that was introduced and passed in the House um, had those retroactive relief provisions. Um, and the recently uh, introduced discussion draft on the Senate side is substantively identical in terms of the criminal justice provisions as the MORE Act. Um, but like we've seen in states, the way that those provisions are crafted, I think would leave out the majority of individuals that have suffered under federal prohibition. Um, Again, if you sort of tailor those provisions to language like a nonviolent federal cannabis offense, um, of course, the way that the system is structured is that there are so many individuals who have just a, you know, they have been incarcerated for selling or manufacturing cannabis, but the way that looks on their record, on their sentencing report, is not just a nonviolent marijuana offense, right? So they're going to have all kinds of ancillary charges, again, money laundering on the federal level, conspiracy charges. Um, and we see that with our constituents across the board. I mean, it's just, there are no people incarcerated federally that have just one marijuana offense. And that violent nonviolent dichotomy, of course, is especially problematic. We have so many constituents who will get a firearms charge um, included in their marijuana conviction because they had a firearm, even if it was legally registered at, with them at the time of the offense, that can be seen as a violent offense. So there's a lot of work I think that needs to be done to ensure that these provisions are effectuated in the way that we want to see them. And of course, unfortunately, the vast majority of people who are still incarcerated for cannabis offenses are in custody at the state and local level. Um, but I do think this bill is still critically important. Even if we're not sure about the chances of it passing, I do think it's really important to get this language right now because I think so many states will look to this as the model for their reforms. And of course, the ball rolling on states legalizing and including these kinds of provisions in their state legislation is not slowing down. And hopefully that will be a signal to our federal government, um, but they will look to this as a model. So we really need to ensure that those provisions are crafted in a way that's going to, again, be equitable and effectuate relief for the majority of individuals that are still suffering at the federal level. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. and. Um... What Sarah is describing is that um, in the MORE Act, uh, the criminal justice piece refers to only non people with nonviolent marijuana offenses being eligible for resentencing and expungement. And that was a piece that was added to the bill as it moved to the floor last year, something that the coalition was adamantly opposed to in addition to other problematic things that were added. So this year we are pushing to remove that language because I totally agree. One, you know, this, I, I think, you know, we're on the cusp of legalizing at the federal level, so we want to make sure that we do it right, but we also thought this is a model bill for states and we want to make sure that we get it right. 
So we're definitely working um, to take that out of the MORAF. And in the Senate, we're offering recommendations on the criminal justice piece. And part of that recommendation is that we remove any sort of carve outs, um, which has been our position all along. Um, and I feel like I was going to say something else related to that. Um, but if it comes to me, I'll share it here. But Ian, I, I don't know if you want to Oh, so I'm just going to add quickly on this. Yeah. Um, as Maritza mentioned, they are accepting public comment um, through the beginning of September. You probably know better, but I September very much, 1st. September 1st. So yeah. I very much encourage, especially criminal justice advocates that, you know, have thoughts on this, or especially if you have experienced this through your work in the system, you know, the kinds of things that we're talking about, about why, you know, not having a label like a nonviolent marijuana offense, the way that charges get stacked. Um, it's so important for legislators to hear about how the system actually functions, because so often they don't have that kind of firsthand experience or education when they're creating this legislation. So they really need to hear from you all, the stakeholders that have that expertise. Yeah, I would echo that. That's absolutely critical. Um, and then I remembered what I was going to say. So another thing that we want to address on the Senate side is the situation where you might have an individual who maybe the underlying conviction is a marijuana conviction, but then they have an enhancement or vice versa, like more complicated cases. I think the bill needs to better address that. But, you know, as Sarah said, it's really important that they hear from experts, people who are either directly impacted or criminal defense lawyers um, so that they could hear from others, because I feel like as an advocate, I can say this stuff until I'm blue in the face. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but like, it's too politically, you know, uh, consequential, or, you know, there's, it, it, it comes down to a lot of politics. But, you know, I'm not interested in politics. And I think here, we want to make good policy, because we understand that people's lives are at stake, like, this isn't a game, we're talking about people's lives. So definitely encourage you all to give some input there. And Ian, I'll turn to you if you have anything to add on the federal discussion. I think that you all covered it very well. The, the, only, thing, the only thing that I'll add in, it, in addition to the retroactive relief that, that um, Sarah's referring to is a forward thinking uh, reinvestment in communities. And there's a pretty, uh, pretty hefty federal tax uh, that's being proposed in there. Um, some would argue, uh, myself included, that it's a little bit too high, uh, at least as a starting point, um, because we do want to we do want to tread that line between keeping people uh, focused on the, re the the regulated market, moving towards regulated, and 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 the opportunity to to come forward and be a part of it, versus uh, engaging in, in in an existing illicit market where things are un untraced, un untaxed, un untested as well. Um, so taking those taxes and reinvesting in the communities that have been disenfranchised is something that I think is of utmost importance um, as we move forward and is often overlooked. So Ian, I'm gonna keep you in the hot seat. We have a lot of, well, we have a couple of questions on Colorado. So yeah. the, these are audience questions. The first is, do you have any data indicating that the Colorado cannabis laws have reduced the jail population um, excuse me, have reduced the population in state prisons and county jails? That's the first question. And then the second one is, what has Colorado done to keep the multi-state organizations that have developed in the medical market from dominating the recreational market and limiting entry of small local businesses? Sure, I'm happy to answer them both. Um, Tom, it, in relation to the first question, um, I, I, don't have, I don't have the report right in front of me, but just a couple of weeks ago, Colorado uh, released uh, a buy, they released it every other year. It's a marijuana impacts report. It's put out uh, in large part with the Colorado Department of Public Safety. And so I would encourage you to look at that. There is a section specifically, um, specifically on that. Um, and then uh, the second part of your question in, in terms of taxes, I know Maritza didn't ask, but um, very, very uh, quickly, you can go to the, to the state website or you can go to the Marijuana Enforcement Division's website and you can see on an annual basis um, in terms of taxes as well as where those dollars are going. And then in terms of Claire's question, what has Colorado done to keep MSOs that have developed from dominating the rec market and limiting the small local businesses? Well, it, two things have happened. One, we have, we have permitted multi-state operators into coming into Colorado because previously we had mandated residents only, mandated vertical integration and did not acknowledge that there were other states and that there's other businesses. There's virtually no other business um, in the country 
or industry type in the country where you can't engage in commerce um, in some capacity across state lines, be it manufacturing. And so while we've opened the state up to allow any kind of business, because we are a pro-business state and we believe very much in innovation and disruption. If, if you're familiar with our, our governor, he's got a, a very, uh, a very uh, rich past in terms of, of engaging in innovative and disruptive uh, businesses. We've also done things to, to, not, to not allow um, those types of businesses to, to dominate. This past year, for example, um, there was a delivery bill that was uh, moved forward that was seeking to restrict delivery in large capacity before it ever even got started. Uh, many who have been involved in the industry, at least in Colorado, know that there's a unique opening for these new delivery permits and an opportunity to create um, a new niche for social equity applicants because delivery really doesn't exist here yet. So the opportunity to allow social equity applicants to get a leg up in that, in that business and in that niche of, of, of or that vertical, uh, there was an attempt by some to prevent, uh, to, to restrict who could engage in delivery. And the governor and and uh, and other folks were very were very assertive in suggesting that that is bad for business, bad for small businesses, creates unfair competitive advantages. And we went about and we killed the bill and asked the sponsor to withdraw. And and think that when there are opportunities to uh, to create an even playing field uh, by not enacting legislation that would benefit a small subset of the industry. It's really important. And so we're going to continue to, to have those types of conversations. I'm sure it's going to come around again with hospitality, but um, we are taking proactive measures um, in some effect to, uh, to try to even the playing field as much as possible, while still recognizing that we do live in a capitalistic society in, in, in here in the United States and that we want to be pro-business to all who wish to be involved. Thank you. And audience, I would um, encourage you to submit more questions. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, so we're here to answer any questions that might have come up as you're hearing this discussion. Um, but another question I had for the panelists is um, generally, what's been the most challenging, challenging aspect of creating marijuana policy that's equitable? Um, like, what do you think is the most challenging about the work that you're doing? And I'd also be curious to hear what have you seen that's working and what gives you hope for an equitable future? And I will just share that, you know, I do sometimes get frustrated because I feel like a lot of the same problems we're seeing time and time again in each state. Um, so maybe like as a side note, like, I guess what type of coordination is happening or should be happening between states <laughs> to make sure that these lessons learned, like people can actually take advantage of. Cause that's something that I've seen, you know, come up time and time again. And, you know, I thought like, like, is there like some sort of bank, like some sort of, I don't know, um, informal working group that people should be collaborating on or joining, anything like that. Um, but yeah, just some thoughts I had. But again, so what's the most challenging aspect of creating equitable marijuana policy? Um, and then what gives you all hope for an equitable future? And if you wanna to respond to my little rant there, you're more than happy to. <laughs> um, whoever wants to go first, Chelsea, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. Um... I think that you're exactly right. I think that we're facing a lot of the same challenges and I do wanna uh, actually respond a little bit to not the rant, but I think to the message, um, it, you actually mentioned your Marijuana Justice Coalition and here in Virginia, we're called Marijuana Justice and we actually have no formal relationship to DPA, but I've been following DPA for years and our organizers have been following DPA for years. And much of our study that we put in in 2020 was based off of what we saw New York do. And um, honestly, working very closely with Melissa Moore and Cassandra Federique and, and really informing myself. Because to answer your other question, what was the most difficult thing? It was truly getting all of our information for our advocates here, as well as ensuring that our legislators are fully informed, particularly with the process and or what's happening right now in marijuana. Um, and that does, go, that is, it must take coalition building across states. So um, in Virginia, I just really wanna lift how we've been able to work really closely and, and learn from the many messages of DPA. Uh, we're working really closely as well with folks in Illinois and their Illinois Equity Coalition, particularly even around what to do with tax revenues at this point and how to create some hope with what's going on there. 
Um, and, you know, I would, I said in the beginning that we're the first state in the South. So if folks in the South are looking at this and looking to create maybe that think tank group as we continue to do this, um, I think that that is a, an excellent strategy and organizing point that for people that are motivated that could touch on what some of the biggest um, barriers are and the hardest parts and give ourselves some relief as well as to make ourselves not feel crazy when we're having to pull up all this data just to prove what we have been saying, what our people have been saying for such a long time. Chelsea, as you've built the coalition, have there been any unlikely allies? Um, you know, I, I did not think that this was necessarily unlikely, but youth advocates, particularly even under 18, I think that that surprises a lot of folks, um, particularly because they we say protect young people from marijuana. It, it looks like a different type of protection of almost criminalizing them and keeping them away. So um, having a lot of the parents, even on the adult rec side and not saying it's just for medical um, as well as, you know, there have been a lot of folks that, um, you know, religious folks that normally may be in uh, incarceration prison reform, but cannabis is a little much here in the South, y'all. Um, we have a, a Bible belt and, and understanding our culture there. So I think the unlikely allies have, have really come in all sorts of shapes. And because marijuana is such a large bill and, and topic, um, as our coalition in state, we um, continue, please follow the Legalize It Right Coalition and what we're doing. Um, it's ourselves, Marijuana Justice, Justice Forward, Virginia, who's a, gr a group of public defenders, um, as well as Rise for Youth and Virginia Student Power Network. Uh, we've also just been able to spread out this over 500 page bill and find folks, uh, business folks that might not always agree with us, even legislators that really want to do incarceration or, or enforcement can start to understand the business side. So we're able to leverage a lot of talking points um, to, to try and really punch that equity in somewhere. I will add that one of the things that I think is, uh, is challenging with creating an equitable marijuana policy is, um, is engaging the proper stakeholders. Um, there's such a wide diverse array of stakeholders and people on both sides with very strong opinions one way or the other. And, you know, one would art, one, one may suggest that the best, you know, the best end game is where nobody is happy in the end with negotiations because, or not everybody is happy with the way that things turn out, but you really, really need to be um, really critical and, and, uh, and open and, and, you know, Colorado, Colorado has engaged in their rulemaking um, for regulated marijuana businesses. In fact, I, I dropped out of one and I'm headed back there right now, dealing with three different laws that we have going right now to allow um, medical and retail transfers and outdoor cultivation permissions and, and a very, uh, very anti-marijuana bill that passed this past year in relation to regulating marijuana concentrates. But the point of that is there's these robust stakeholder conversations that take place. And there's a wide array of stakeholders on there. The, the director of our marijuana enforcement division, Dominique Mendiola, mentioned this morning that there were 27 new stakeholders that were added to this virtual conversation for today based on those three bills. And we've been engaged for the past couple of months on that. So the ability to stop, recognize midstream that there's an ability to make changes, to bring more people to the table, to engage in wider conversation, to have a better outcome, it may not be, you know, there's, there's, you know, two sides or three sides or four sides to the cannabis coin. Um, there's so many different opinions to be had. And so it's, it's although recognizing that not every, um, everything is going to be accomplished from day one, the opportunity to be dynamic, to include stakeholders from, from all sides and engage with them in a respectful, uh, meaningful dialogue is, is a really challenging aspect. And as states and local municipalities and even the federal government looks to, to do this, it's really important that they're bringing the right people to the table. I was excited to see that when some of these federal conversations started happening, there were, there were key stakeholders um, that work um, in, in, in uh, helping right the past wrongs that were brought to the table to engage with the senators and to engage with their committees. And it was really refreshing, frankly, to see that because several years ago, that wasn't taking place. And the last thing that I'll say with creating an equitable marijuana policy is bringing uh, the, the different 
parties in our in our in the political parties here in America together to a conversation. And we're at this really critical and interesting time right now where um, those who work in policy and those who work in, in lobbying have this opportunity to reach out to both sides of the aisle because we're at this point where for different reasons, finally, for the first time in history, there's motivation for the Republicans to support it and there's motivations for the Democrats to support it. They may not agree on why, but they can all agree that it's the right thing to do. And so the ability to, to take that and work with the different parties, the people that you may not normally engage with and recognize that you might have more common goals than you think when it comes to this conversation in particular is something that I think that's really important as we move about creating an equitable marijuana policies in, in, in our local jurisdictions and our states and here in the United States and really around the world. Yes, and I will say that National League polling suggests that this issue is also politically popular across party lines, across demographic groups. So, you know, you would think that that would be enough to motivate Congress, but unfortunately it takes more than that. So again, please do engage with your lawmakers. And it's higher, Maritza, it's important to mention that it's higher than ever before than it's ever right. in the history of the United States. It's at right. a time high. And so this is the time to seize the moment now to move forward with, with enacting those policies. Absolutely. Sarah? I'll echo what Ian said, um, especially again, for the criminal justice advocates, I think, so often in the past, criminal people with criminal justice expertise, systems impacted individuals, public defenders, progressive prosecutors have really been absent from these conversations. And I think it's hard when you have a comprehensive legalization package and there's so much going on to ensure that those advocates and those with that expertise and that experience have a seat at the table, um, but it's critically important because I think that's exactly how you avoid um, states and federally seeing the same mistakes happen over and over again. And because of course our criminal justice system is so fundamentally broken because there are so many nuanced issues at the federal, state, and local level when we talk about criminal justice, when we talk about just getting the data that we need to fix these problems or to even to recognize that there is a problem, it's critically important that we have these stakeholders. Um, but that's also what gives me hope. It's amazing to see NACDL create a space in their conference for this, exactly this panel. We're seeing so many more criminal justice organizations and advocates understand that cannabis reform can be such an effective tool to redress so many of the issues that we are facing around reimagining our system from policing to sentencing, mass incarceration. And so it's so important that we do focus on this and we bring the right expertise to the table. So thank you to NACDL for having us. And I hope that more criminal justice experts will engage on this issue. Thanks, Sarah. And thank you also for ending us on a high note there. Um, so in the chat, I'm about to put in a link where you all could um, contact a member of Congress to help us pass the MORE Act again in the House this year. Um, again, uh, you know, this is important in order to build momentum for what's happening in the Senate. And I really do believe that we're on the cusp of legalization, but we know we have to do it right. So we encourage you all to contact your lawmakers and really engage in the process in both the House and the Senate. And thank you to our panelists for, for being here and providing your expertise on this important topic. It was great to learn from all of you and be in community with you today. And thank you for all your work.